My name is David Weisskopf. I am a joint student in Law and Environment and Resources through the Law School and the EIPER program at Stanford University. Uh, the second panel will be on coordinating international governance for marine conservation. Uh, we have four fantastic panelists for this uh, talk. First, we'll hear from Jeff Ardern from the Institute for Advanced Studies in Sustainability. He's here all the way from Potsdam, Germany. Thank you for traveling. Followed by David Freestone, who is Executive Director of the Sargasso Sea Alliance and visiting scholar at the George Washington um, University Law School in Washington, D.C. Following Dr. Friesen, we'll hear from Ann Powers, who's professor at Pace Law School, Center for Environmental Legal Studies in New York, as well as, <coughs> excuse me, as well as Nicholas Robinson, who's also a professor at Pace Law School in New York, and adjunct professor at Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, Jeff Ardern's talk will be an overview of high seas governance and why dynamic is not a word that comes to mind. <laughs> Professor Freestone will discuss problems of governance in areas beyond national jurisdiction and with regard to the Sargasso Sea Project in particular. Professor Powers will discuss lessons from the Pacific examining marine conservation regimes um, employed in Pacific Island states. And finally, Nicholas Robinson will offer recommendations for navigating the legal maze that has been laid out in the previous three talks, um, as well as evolving laws for marine conservation. Okay. Uh, with no further ado, please welcome Jeff Ardron from the IASS in Potsdam. Good afternoon, and um, this is not the opportunity to lie back and sleep. That'll be the next talk. Uh, so, so just, just hang in. Uh, <laughs> sorry, David. My, na my name is Jeff Ardron, and yes, I, I work right now in Germany um, at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Sustainability in Potsdam, just outside of Berlin. Um, I will be talking most, mostly about areas beyond national jurisdiction or what we illegally call the high seas, like. Um, but beyond national jurisdiction. Um, but a lot of what I say and a lot of um, the principles, of course, would apply in any remote area, um, even if it's in national jurisdiction. Um, I certainly agree with the concept of dynamic management. I've uh, published on it a little bit, but um, we're not seeing a lot of it right now um, in the high seas. So I'm going to do a quick overview of some of the governance mechanisms and then um, some of the ways that I see around, uh, going forward around this. And I'm supposed to have a timekeeper. Is someone here my timekeeper? Great. So you'll give me um, the big five minute warning, right? Wonderful. Okay. Um, so, and then there was light. And on the left side were the greenies, and on the right were the brownies. And the sectoral and the conservation. And in the middle was customary international law. And then after, oh, I don't know, it depends when you start counting. If you start with uh, 1930, after about, uh, whatever, 50 years of negotiations, we got UNCLOS. The United Nations Law of the Sea was supposed to encapsulate customary international law, but I would argue, and I think many would agree, that it went beyond customary international law in some respects um, with regard to seabed mining and, and other things. Um, UNCLOS managed to spawn a number of agreements, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement and the Part 11 Agreement around um, mining. And then these agreements produced regional fisheries management organizations, the International Maritime Organization, and the International Seabed Authority. This presentation, by the way, is going to um, have two records on one s set on one slide, the number of clicks for the number of little objects that come onto the screen, and the number of acronyms. Um, and I will dutifully say every acronym, but only once. So you have to pay attention, OK? <laughs> there is a quiz at the end. Um, all right. And, and they're connected either um, through direct uh, procedural methods or um, at least indirect methods. And, that, and they're all sectoral. They, the fisheries management organizations, as you might expect, manage fisheries. The maritime organization manages shipping. And the seabed authority, mining. Um, so we're talking about sectoral, single um, sort of uh, industrial use kind of um, arrangement. 
We have some agreements that lie somewhere in between this continuum of conservation and sectoral management, uh, starting at the top, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the London Convention, the London Protocol, which I'll come back to in a minute, CITES, which we were just discussing, um, the International Whaling Commission, and World Heritage Commission, which I'll come back to again in a minute. Um, and then on the left-hand side, we have uh, roughly what are called, um, well, the Rio agreements. Um, most significant of that would be um, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Convention on Migratory Species um, is not a Rio agreement, but it's also a conservation agreement. And then the Regional Seas Conventions, which were primarily set up to deal with uh, pollution and then a broader environmental mandate after that. Um, and yes, the London Convention Protocol, as I'm sure many of you know, sits underneath the International Maritime Organization. It's one of the sub-agreements, and in fact, there's something like 65 sub-agreements under the IMO, and I can't keep track of them all. Um, and likewise, um, in the conservation agreements, there's memorandums of understanding and other agreements under the Convention of Migratory Species. The uh, African-Eurasian Waterbird Agreement is probably the most famous, but there's a Sharks Agreement and others. And um, these are either directly or somewhat indirectly managed um, to the United Nations Environmental Program. And the environmental, that reports the United Nations General Assembly, which also has um, some connection to the FAO, but, but not fully. The FAO is an independent uh, uh, treaty organization. So I, I made a little color coding here. Let me see. Oh, yeah, the colors aren't bad today. I presented this slide in, in another talk where you couldn't see any of the colors. So we're looking good, you know. Silicon Valley, they know how to do PowerPoint. <laughs> um, and, uh, we, uh, and, and so I have this, this distinction where I have what I call, very loosely speaking, soft law and hard law, and, and this continuum. And, and you'll notice that everything is red on the right-hand side of the screen, that these sectoral agreements are hard law. They, ha they, they, they have binding rules and regulations, as binding as you can get in the high seas. Um, and on the left-hand side, you have generally voluntary agreements. Um, not entirely, but generally. Um, and, and plans of action and, and, you know, we're going to save the world, plan of action number 37 and things like that. So we have a very different sort of governance structure going from the left to the right of this, this screen. Um, and then some that fall in between the regional seas conventions will both have voluntary arrangements and, and some binding uh, measures. Uh, likewise, with the FAO, there's two binding agreements that it has spawned, the uh, High Seas Compliance Agreement and the Port State Measures Agreement that Jane mentioned earlier this morning, uh, but also a lot of voluntary you know, uh, codes as well, the, uh, the global plans of action for sharks and so forth. So there are some linkages. The FAO um, advises the RFMOs. Um, CMS and CITES with the sharks. Now that the sharks have gone through CITES, woohoo! Thank you to everyone who, <laughs> who, who, who worked on that. And uh, also, um, there was, it was a global effort. I think many of you know that actually Germany was the first country to put forward sharks and CITES. Um, and I'm in Germany, ja, Deutschland. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so it, was, it was a group effort. Um, and so now CITES and the CMS are talking. But, you know, <clears throat> there'll have to be more discussions. Between the regional seas conventions and the RFMOs, we have had some discussions mainly between, in the Northeast Atlantic, between the OSPAR regional seas convention and the um, RFMO up there called NAAF, Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission. So there's been some communication. But really, there's a, the, the big gap in this picture is that everyone's been doing their own thing for the last 40 years, 40 or 50 years. Uh, you know, these agreements have come in at different times. Uh, you know, uh, C CBD is 20 years old, as, as you know. Um, so more cooperation, more cooperation between CITES and the RFMOs now, now that some commercial species are listed on CITES. We'll have to see that a kind of cooperation we've never seen before. Um, and then there are these things called EBSAs and VMEs. Does anyone ever heard the word EBSA before? Yeah, ecologically or biologically significant areas um, under the CBD. And they've been describing these around the world. And it's sort of in parallel, there's these UNGA resolutions passed upon bottom fisheries. And the RFMOs are looking for things called vulnerable marine ecosystems that are similar but not the same in, in principle. The difference being, again, One's on the right-hand side, so that means it has hard binding measures attached to it. One's on the left-hand side, which means it's all soft and squishy. Uh, but there's been no connection to speak of, very little connection to speak of, between the EBSAs and VME processes to date. And, and this is a clear problem. Um, I've, I've been to one or two of the meetings where they're supposedly, yeah, anyway. 
Save that for question time. There's a lot of spatial measures out there. Um, under the Regional Seas Agreements, the MPAs, so OSPAR set up what it called the first network of high seas MPAs a couple years back. Uh, might have been a bit of a generous uh, title, but um, the RFMOs have their VMEs, as I mentioned. The IMO has particularly sensitive sea areas as well as all the special areas that fall under MARPOL. And you notice a lot of these sub-agreements like MARPOL and, and SOLAS and so forth, I could not fit on this slide. So. Uh, please don't test me at the end. What happened to Marpol? It's just IMO. Um, the ISA has its um, reference areas as well as a new designation it came up with uh, last year, the areas of particular environmental interest, uh, or was it two years ago maybe? Um, so there's all these spatial measures out there, but again, there's a need to bind them together on the, uh, on the sectoral side, on the right-hand side of the diagram. Um, as well as on the left-hand side, but most critically, binding that left and right, binding the conservation agreements to the sectoral agreements, that was that last dotted line that drifted down from the heavens, that hasn't happened yet. That has not, in fact, it's a long ways away from happening, I argue. Um, so, at the very bottom of the World Heritage Convention, and I've just clicked the button that shows that it could, the principle of universal world heritage could be a way to bind these agreements together, together. Everyone understands the concept of the best of the best, and that's what the World Heritage is supposed to do. Now, it is not currently being applied in areas beyond national jurisdiction, just in case you missed that memo. It is not being applied in areas beyond national jurisdiction. I want to make that perfectly clear so that I'm not accused of suggesting something that's not real. But it could be applied conceivably. Um, and that's a, a discussion that you may want to get into in the question period, but there's nothing in the convention that says it only applies to national waters. Uh, my interpretation would be that it's a procedural question of how to apply it uh, in, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, not whether it could apply, but how it could be applied. Um, but regardless, what we need is some sort of binding, some sort of conduit, some sort of nexus around which all these agreements can start to cooperate. And something like identifying the best of the best, thank you, um, could be one way to do this. Another way to do this, which uh, is Christina's thunder, tomorrow morning's um, uh, uh, talk, and Christina uh, will, I know, talk about this, uh, uh, is this idea of some sort of overarching agreement, um, maybe an implementing agreement under um, United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea or another cooperative mechanism. And, and so th this could be another way to try to get these, all these little blobs on my diagram to start speaking to one another. So to summarize my thoughts on this, and then I'm just going to shoot through a few just quick pictures um, that will tie into some of tomorrow's discussions. Um, I think that not all problems are, are solved taking a holistic approach, but I think some are. Um, I think we've gotten away using single sector management actually quite well for things like biofouling and ballast water you know, exchange and all kinds of things with shipping and, and so forth. But some things like multi-sector, um, uh, multi-use MPAs, uh, fully protected areas, uh, cumulative impact assessments, cumulative impact assessment procedures, that will require cooperation. And we're not seeing that cooperation right now. Um, and, and the big three, let's face it, are shipping, mining, and, and now emerging, uh, shipping, fishing, excuse me, and now emerging mining. Um, and they're not yet under any, under any memorandums of understanding or anything else. There, there, there is no MOUs amongst these three big, big human uses in the ocean. And fisheries, remember, has a cumulative impact greater than all other human impacts combined. So fisheries is the biggest one by far. In fact, it's estimated in some studies as 10 to 100 times greater than all other human impacts combined. So, so, so although emerging activities are important, let's not forget the existing ones. Fisheries affect ecosystems more than everything else combined. Um, but this is a, a conference about dynamic uh, measures, and so how can we um, respond dynamically, uh, especially when negotiations for new UN agreements and stuff are just by the very nature very slow moving, very incremental, uh, not kind of turn on a dime, gosh, the fish have moved over here, we'll change our arrangements. So how can we fit into that kind of world that I argue is the new world order, it is the Anthropocene, this new geological epoch whereby we are the driving force now on the planet. And with, as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. So I argue that there's a society 3.0, you've heard of what, the web 2.0, which is uh, social networking. Um, 
uh, 3.0 is actually when we feed back, when we're not just talking to our friends on Facebook, but we're actually looking at what's going on in the planet and we feed back. Um, we can now, we have antennas and, uh, to actually track where all vessels are on the planet, and the Germans are very proudly coming up with even a new technology to do this. Um, there's a new arm going on the, uh, that old rusty space station up there. What are we going to do with it? New high-def demilitarized uh, or, or declassified military quality cameras that are now going to be put on using um, a private company where you can take pictures anywhere um, in the next couple of years of what's going on in the oceans at, with high enough resolution that you can see if people are fishing in your protected areas. We don't need to rely on proprietary methods and data secrecy that we've previously had. Wave glider, hey, hey, there it is. <laughs> As well, we got a few other of the other um, remote, <coughs> remote divers out there. They're what I call medium cost solutions, um, starting to get more sentinels on the ocean. And then finally, um, mobile phone applications. Um, this is the trawler application used in, in West Africa to uh, identify uh, where trawlers, where the people see trawlers. Basically the rule is if you can see the trawler, they're breaking the rules because they're supposed to be 12 nautical miles offshore. So they take the people take a picture on their phone, and that phone gets up that picture time stamped and GPS stamped gets uploaded to um, actually a public website as well as to the local authorities to say, look, here's this vessel, generally from Taiwan or an Asian country, and is fishing within visual distance of the shore. This is the kind of response that we will need to have, the kind of flexibility we will have need to have. We can no longer rely just on the United Nations. So that is um, my conclusion, and just in case you're wondering, yes, deliberations are still continuing in the IMO on what to do about those greenhouse gases. Thank you very much. As with the previous panels, we'll now take uh, just one or two clarifying questions, and of course, if there are questions from the board today, we'll have some questions from the panel. Uh, if you don't ask me a question, I'm going to ask you those acronym questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, my name is Aaron Tinker. I'm with the Marine Science Institute. Um, I was curious when you mentioned crowdsourcing. I'm very interested in the role of citizen science in assisting um, these larger global ocean management issues. So can you talk a little bit more about ways that can be effective linking local to the global? Yeah, Thanks. sure. So crowdsourcing, I think everyone is familiar with the term crowdsourcing, using people to, to break down complicated questions. Um, they're looking at, for instance, um, you know, galaxies and what constitutes a galaxy. And because so, the universe is such a big place, um, little bits of it, little bits of stars are, are chunked up. And then you can send them out to your home computer and get a bunch of people to vote whether that looks like a galaxy or not. Because the way a galaxy looks is, 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 is too complicated to run just through an algorithm. We can do the same thing with vessels, satellite imagery. You can chunk up satellite pictures, send them out to the web and say, do you think this vessel's fishing? Because right? it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. You've got to look at the wake. You've got to see if there's any reflection on any, any gear in the water. You've got to calculate speeds. But, you can, but through crowdsourcing, you could actually start to break up whether vessels are actually what they're doing in the water. So that's one way, breaking up masses of data into small bits and then reassembling the data. And, uh, and, and, and not just allowing one vote, but allowing 10, 20, 30 votes on each, each one of those broken up chunks. The other way is using things like mobile phone applications. You always hear from the commercial fishing guys, oh, it's those recreational fishers. They're the ones that are catching all the fish. They're breaking all the rules. And then you hear the very same thing from the recreational guys. Oh, it's those commercial guys. They're, they're breaking all the rules. Give them each mobile phone applications to, to snitch on each other. Right? <laughs> Let them snitch on one another, you know, and, and, and see who's right. Okay. Thank you for the question. Afternoon. This is the graveyard session. Thanks to Jeff for covering all the boring bits. Uh, this is the dynamic bit. <laughs> we have an ongoing interest. And many thanks indeed to Stanford for inviting us here. I think this has been a really interesting session. Right, so I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, within the allotted time, 
uh, some issues which relate to the absence of coherence of a uh, system, really, of uh, governance of what the lawyers call areas beyond national jurisdiction, the uh, UN as well, ABNJ. And I'm going to talk uh, more about the project which I'm working on, which relates to the conservation of the Sargasso Sea, led by the Sargasso Sea Alliance, which is actually led by the government of Bermuda. So a few words about the Law of the Sea Convention first. Uh, then we'll look at, uh, and, and perhaps a little bit about the model of what perhaps the drafters of the uh, uh, convention had in mind, which hasn't materialized, uh, and then how, whether it's possible to create protected areas within the existing system. Nearly 50% of the planet's surface. So this gives rise to the joke about the World Heritage Convention, that if it doesn't cover 50% of, uh, of the world's uh, area, perhaps it should be called half the world's heritage con convention, and that's really hurt them. They don't like that, and so you know, they're looking at this again. Um, human impacts we've heard about, uh, absolutely right, as uh, Jeff said earlier, about the impacts of fishing, huge in incremental increase in fishing, we've heard from the panel this morning, and lots of new activities as well. Uh, so things like uh, ocean fertilization discussions, uh, renewable energy extensions up into the high seas, these sorts of things which are uh, need a, a, at least a minimum of uh, regulation, but which there isn't really a, a, a modality for because, as we said in the last time, the only, there's no comprehensive system of governance. There's all, it's all sectoral, it's all stovepipe. Uh, the only body that does have wide-ranging powers is the Seabed Authority, but that's only in relation to mineral uh, resource extraction, and that's, that's the half of the world that's uh, not covered by national jurisdiction. So what did the drafters of the Law of the Sea Convention have in mind? I won't go through this in too much detail, but remember that there are seven freedoms which are set out by the, all, by, by the Convention, all of which are subject to quite important conditions which people forget about. Uh, I'm not going to go through those, but they're all conditional. This amazing provision of Article 192, which talks about protect the obligation, it's an unconditional obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. I mean, it's an amazing, I can't think of a similar provision in, 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 in another treaty. And then there are obligations to protect and preserve rare or fragile ecosystems, as well as the habitats of depleted, threatened, and endangered species and other forms of marine life. So those are really important obligations, general overarching obligations. There are also obligations on environmental impact assessment, but in relation to the activities of coastal states uh, when they're acting beyond national jurisdiction, I won't go through those because they, they won't take up too much time, but we can come back to that if you like. And then this provision, Article 197, which is actually worth reading, States shall cooperate on a global basis and, as appropriate, on a regional basis, directly or through competent international organizations, in formulating and elaborating international rules, standards, and recommended practices and procedures consistent with this convention for the protection and preservation of the marine environment, taking into account characteristic regional features. So that suggests that states should be talking to each other, both directly and also through international organizations. And as we've seen from this very powerful slide of Jeff's, it doesn't happen. That's what I'm arguing is perhaps a breach of law. So those are the limitations. We've got a lot of unregulated activities. There are geographical gaps in the system. I can show you just a couple of slides on that. Uncoordinated rulemaking, poor implementation, and very weak enforcement. We're most of you are familiar with this, with uh, Ben Halpin's uh, study, which looks at the increasing impacts of human activities on various areas of the ocean. We'll talk about that a little bit later. This is the region we heard about, the regional seas conventions. Only a few of them actually have powers beyond the 200-mile zone. And those you can see that's the OSPAR Convention, Northeast Atlantic, uh, South Pacific, um, and uh, Camelot are the most obvious ones, as well as Mediterranean. And although we have fairly comprehensive coverage in relation to the regulation of, of tuners, and whether you think that's good or whether it's done well or not is another question, there isn't even comprehensive regional management of uh, fisheries. Uh, fisheries organizations don't cover all the regions. Those are, I'm particularly interested in the North Atlantic. You can see there's, we heard about NIAF, which is the Northeast Atlantic uh, Fisheries Organization, which cooperates with OSPAR. And then to the left of that is NAFO, the Northwest Atlantic, but only below the, they only just go above the North, 35 North. And so the area I'm interested in, 
Bermuda is actually south of that, so they're not covered. So what can we do if we're supposed to rely on international organizations to have protection and to have pro to pro take protective measures at a regional level using existing organizations if we don't have the sort of implementation, implementing agreement, which I know that Christina will talk about tomorrow, and which is being discussed, uh, has already been discussed for like nearly eight years in the, uh, in the UN, what can we do? And this is what our project is designed to do. It's based in Bermuda. Bermuda is a small archipelago in the middle of the, of the uh, North Atlantic. Uh, it's about a thousand miles from the U U.S. border. It's on the main highway between U.S. and Europe, and yet there is no regional environmental body that governs it, and there's no regional fisheries management organization which covers it either. Um, the Sargasso Sea is uh, a picture of it, and this map was actually put together by so Duke, as a acknowledged uh, Daniel, and also Jeff as well when he was at uh, MCBI. So this map actually shows that it's a gyre. The Sargasso Sea is held in place based, based on a picture of the mats of sargassum, which are a form of holopelagic seaweed, which reproduces without contact with the, with the Earth. So it starts from the Gulf, it swept into the Atlantic, and then it gets carried around the Atlantic gyres, the Gulf Stream, and then the Azores Current, and the uh, and the, and the uh, Antilles currents, it's held in place. Just, we heard about plastic this morning, the plastic, particularly in the Pacific, we have this, uh, these plastic um, garbage collections because the gyres hold it together, so what's, that holds, what holds the sargassum within the gyre. So it's a unique system, and because most ocean, ocean, uh, ocean systems, open ocean systems, don't have uh, seaweed in this sort of quantities, it actually provides an amazingly important habitat. So it's a unique system. It's the only place in the world where this happens. It's about two million square miles, uh, and it's really important for the life, life cycles of a large number of species, which I'll, I'll look at. Uh, it's a feeding nursery area for uh, some interesting iconic species there. The little turtles swim out from the coast, and they spend, that's where they spend many of them of their lost years, for a few years, where they eat the sargassum and also provides them with protection. It's like a huge fisheries aggregation device. So you find uh, mahi-mahi, the uh, dolphin fish on the, up on the top right. And it's also, uh, it's the uh, sargassum actually provides a platform for spawning. So that in the middle there are some pictures of, of uh, flying fish eggs. So you can see the sort of fish aggregations underneath it. And then the large guys come in to eat those. Number of species that have adapted to live there. Top left is the famous uh, 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 frogfish, the Histrio histrio, which is actually adapted to crawl through the, through the sargassum. Voracious predator, it's only about two centimeters long, nine centimeters long, but it's pretty small, but it's an interesting species. So those are all adapted to live within the sargassum. And then of course, as I said, a lot of other species Whales are coming, humpbacks are moving back in through there, the turtles. It's certainly an area, established spawning area for, for uh, albacore, a number of other species, and possibly for, for bluefin. Bluefin seem to be there at the time that when they're breeding, where well, they're actually spawning in the Gulf. So there's a suggestion, it hasn't been proven that, but it's important for that as well. And then, the, it's difficult to call an eel iconic, but it is the most important, probably, is that it's the only place in the world where the anguillid eels actually breed. So we know about salmon, that salmon live in the open ocean, the salt water, and then they go back up to the place where they were born to, to spawn, and then the, the adults die, and then the little guys find their way out and go back to the same place. Eels do the reverse. They live in fresh water, the gravid females find their way 3,000 miles from Europe round the systems to, the, to an area south of Bermuda where they spawn and die. And the little guys, leptocephali, find their way back. I don't think they go back to the same place, but we don't know. We know very, it's never been witnessed. We don't know anything about it. So this little map at the side here shows, you can actually see over here, these are the rings are based on the size of the of the leptocephali that they've caught. They've never actually seen it happen, uh, despite tagging, etc. So it's a really interesting phenomenon. And the, the, eel, the European eel, the European eels come from Europe, obviously, and they find their way, then go back to Europe. And the American eels go back to America. I think it's all, there's a little bit of intermarriage. It's a little bit 
of an analogy for the way we work, right? So, um, down to about ten, less than 10% of historic levels. The Europeans are really concerned about the, uh, about the European heel. So this part of the thing, that's, part of the point is that this is a, a system which is under pressure. We've got pictures of it's one of the most busy uh, trade routes, of course. That's it. The, the uh, picture on the top right is just from one month of travel, which is we used AIS data. We have had a, uh, a study done. That's one month. If you actually had the whole year, it would be white. The whole map would be white from traffic of, of, uh, of large vessels. So it's a really major trade route. Bermuda right in the middle and Sargasso Sea right in the middle of that. We talked about plastics. This was a study, this is based on work done by the Sea Education Authority at uh, Woods Hole. And this is the aggregation of plastics. These are the most, most uh, serious aggregation area and, and the red and then, but this whole area is a hard, huge amounts of plastics. I and mean, we can see some of the sort of discarded fishing uh, uh, equipment and the uh, impacts on, uh, on marine life. And, Certainly, lots of plastics being as, as I think Rashid was saying, it doesn't it, it doesn't photo what is it, it doesn't destroy it doesn't degrade it by it, bio, it, it photo degrades rather than biodegrades it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and it's a sort of unpleasant soup you can see there's little bits there. So what are we trying to do? Basically, trying with the leadership of the government of Bermuda, we're trying to get some international recognition of the importance of the ecosystem of uh, of the. So I guess to see, and then using the organisations which which have been described by, uh, by 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 Jeff to actually put some measures in place, uh, in accordance with the Lord Sea Convention. So it, it may be, if Christina has her wish, and I think the wish of many of us, that we actually do get an implementing agreement. But that's not going to happen tomorrow. So let's get on with it. That's basically our agenda, and then we use this as a learning by doing experience. So this is, this is what we're doing. We're using the existing organizations. We've looked at the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, Jeff's done, really done all this heavy lifting on these uh, acronyms, hasn't he? So uh, the ecologically and biologically significant areas idea. We go to the IMO. We're looking at protect, the possibility of particularly sensitive sea areas. Bermuda is still an overseas territory of the UK. So the UK has to be aboard with this, but we actually had out of a forum through this to, to actually put, to go to these organisations for, for measures. And then we're going to look at the fish, going to talk to the fishing organisations. And here's one that you didn't hear, what WWF calls the International Conspiracy to Catch All Tuners, uh, which is ICAT, which is actually, uh, it's the International Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuners and also the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organizations, which are, have some competence there. Then we're looking, so we're looking at fishing threats, risks from extraction of sargassum as possible, measures that we could take. We're looking at the seabed, ISA, the seabed authority. We heard about these areas of particular environmental interest, that's a possibility. We're looking at the World Heritage Convention. UNESCO is really interested in talking to us about it. We're something of a poster child for that proposal to consider. I see these areas as being a World Heritage Sites, and also possibly CMS, because eels and other species use it. Uh, it's a bit of a sleeping convention. So the first thing we had to do was to actually produce a fairly robust case in which a large number of organizations uh, took, took, took part, including uh, MCBI, which is one of, the, one of our uh, partners here, and, and Duke, which is the Duke uh, Lab, is, is also part of that. Um, we had 74 collaborators in this huge report, 11 science institutions, including Woods Hole uh, and also the National Oceanographic Centre in, in Southampton in the UK, but a number of others as well, and also I should mention Rashid and his fisheries centre. Uh, <coughs> that was re reviewed by the Bermuda government and then by the UK Foreign Office and their line ministers, so that's been signed off by them. And that's the basis for the actions which we will now take using the UK, the Bermuda government, and the UK government. And the first success we had actually using this report was to actually get it declared an EPSA. And this is the, the that map which you've seen before is now actually the official map of, of, of the Sargasso Sea EPSA, which was agreed at the um, uh, at a workshop held in Recife. Um, like a little bit of it was the scientific process was then reviewed by the subsidiary body, 
a little bit of discussion as to whether it was actually certainly wasn't endorsed by the conference of the parties. That's a little bit of an agenda which we can talk about. Uh, but there's been a bit of pushback on some of the EBSAs, but what the significance of the EBSAs is. Certainly the intention was it would be a scientific definition of areas that would need some form of protection. We've also got proposals on the table in NAFO, and there you see the, um, the, 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 this is the Bermuda EZ, just peaks over the 35 north, parallel there. And then this is the part of our definition of the EBSA, which actually also peaks into the NAFO regulatory area. Uh, and interestingly, um, a lot of these areas are actually being close to fishing because they're seamounts. So it's actually not a very large amount of area which is there which we're looking for special conservation measures. Last year it was discussed at NAFO with the support of the EU and the US very strongly. Um, nearly got it declared uh, as a closed area. It's been pushed to the Science Committee, which are considering it. There will be another discussion in, in, uh, in June. And ICAT, which is, you know, the Goliath of the fisheries of the tuna organizations, although I'm sure Martin Hall will object because he works for IATC, but this is a huge, or it's a whole of the whole of the, of the Atlantic, north and south. And this, this uh, diagram was produced by Rashid and his team in, uh, in, British, in uh, the University of British Columbia. And basically, blue means lot, not no fishing or little fishing. The bluer it is, it is, the less fishing there is. The redder it is, the more there is, and yellows and some activity. So what we're seeing is this is Bermuda. Within the EZ of Bermuda, there is no inter com commercial fishing because that's, they don't allow it. Uh, this, these little red bits we think are probably misreporting. That might be IUU. We don't you know, it's report it differently. So the very little fishing that takes place actually looks like a fish, doesn't it? And this is the, this is the US catch on the, uh, in, in the Gulf Stream. So we put a proposal to ICAT that this, these squares, which are all high seas except for, the, except for the Bermuda EZ, should actually be subject to special conservation measures. Um, they took out that little part of the proposal and they've referred it to their Standing Committee on Research and Statistics, the SCRS, uh, to actually consider what the effect of the sargassum ecosystem is on tuna and tuna-like species. So that's pretty narrowed down what they've been asked. And they've referred it to their ecosystem subcommittee. It's the first time that the ecosystem subcommittee has been asked to look at an ecosystem. <laughs> and they don't know what to do. <laughs> so the time frame for this is going to be a bit longer than we expected. 2014, they're supposed to make their preliminary report. They're looking at ecosystem components, they're looking at turtles, important stuff, but not an ecosystem report. So we're trying to hold their hands a bit with that. And then the next thing we'll be doing, which will be the kind of coup de grace, is, the, is to hold a meeting in Hamilton, in Bermuda, and that should, by itself should be an attractive proposition, uh, and have an interministerial inter level meeting uh, to s set up a framework for political collaboration. We're not talking about a treaty, that's another 20 years on, so, but we're talking about a political commitment to actually collaborate for the conservation of this. So informal collaboration between the countries that are interested and establishing a Sargasso Sea Commission. Now, there are, we have commissions. We have international set-up commissions. We have national commissions. We have commissions of inquiry. It doesn't mean a lot in terms of it, but it has quite important uh, symbolic significance. We already had a meeting in New York last December uh, where it was a discussion of the draft of the Hamilton Declaration. I think we probably need to have another one. Uh, it's currently being discussed by the EU, actually, tomorrow, um, it's not tomorrow, is it Monday, there's actually a meeting of the Committee of Comar, it's called Comar, not Coma, <laughs> uh, which is in Brussels, which is actually discussing whether the EU should take a concerted position. So it's we've advanced quite a long way with that. Those are the countries we invited, you don't need to look at them, but the, we chose them basically on the basis that they were the countries that are around the region, so Canada, the United States, uh, Bahamas, Dominican Republic, public, etc. And then also the countries of the range states of the US. And then we had a few countries that were just fellow travelers and are interested, like Trinidad, which has been amazingly supported in South Africa. Uh, Portugal is very interested as well as the Azores. So Portugal came to our meeting and the Azores came as well. So it's a bit like the UK and, uh, and, and uh, the overseas territory like the Bahamas. A lot of organizations as well. These are the, oops, these are the, the organizations that we invited. Uh, and we got a lot of support from those as well. Right, so last slide. Uh, what have we learned from this? This is not an easy thing to do, right? It's, 
They're supposed to be, remember I read you Article 197, this is about collaboration between states and regions, between international organizations. They don't like to talk to each other. Uh, very little coordination between this phrase and competent organizations. Same states, uh, we've heard about all the protective arrangements that they deal, they've dealt with, you know, we heard about PSSAs and special areas, fisheries closed areas, VMEs. All of these have been developed by international organizations to have environmental significance, but they're all different, and the requirements are different as well. So different concerns, different epistemic communities, they're you know, different uh, industrial concerns as well. We had thought, high, had high hopes that the CBD EBSAs, which was science-based, would actually be a, a kind of glue to knit these ideas together, but there's been quite a bit of pushback from it. So we're quite pleased that we have been able to achieve that, but uh, it's not quite the, uh, the, the, the golden key of success that we uh, had hoped. So thank you very much, and happy to answer. So David, I would add, this is Phil McGillivray from the Coast Guard. I would ask the um, planning for enforcement and uh, how that is proceeding as well as the declaration. Yeah, tremendous. Thank you very much, Phil. And he's been, Phil is an expert. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this as well. So one of the things that we're envisaging for the, for the Sargassum Sea Commission is that it would take on, it has to be quasi-management responsibility because none of the, you know, as an international, as an organization based perhaps in Bermuda with this, um, uh, and even if all the countries that we listed actually want to take part in the, uh, in, in, in this organization, it would not per se have any management competence. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at the, uh, the catch-22 is that when countries actually uh, that when you go to an international organization and say we'd like to have a protected area in the North Atlantic, they say, how are you going to enforce it? Well, actually, the answer is you're supposed to do it. Right? Flag state responsibility. If IMO passes and agrees to a measure on protective measure, it's supposed to be enforced by the members. But as Phil says, they, want, they throw the question back to us. And the interesting run on from the, quest, from the discussion this morning about dynamic, which Alice was talking about dynamic boundaries, the Coast Guard says to us, Straight lines. If you want to have a protected area, straight lines. We can't enforce it otherwise. So that's quite quite interesting. So we're looking at the way we and we're actually doing some negotiations for uh, for, for a, a possible um, assistance from NASA, which is now interested in using its huge technology to to uh, do ma something. You know, use, I dare say, well, dare say that something useful. But management activities uh, as to whether we can actually, how can we actually try and monitor this huge area. Am I allowed one more question? Very important guy. Thank you. The, the ecosystem, no, Martin Horley again. The, the ecosystem approach and the regional organizations, it's something that uh, it started wrong. It started, the commission started with a very narrow focus. You have a Hollywood commission, tuna commission, tuna and bill fishes only, salmon commission, a very, very targeted towards one or two species. And what I've been trying to do, and I've been seeing this effort, is improve them. But you buy a bicycle and start adding things, you don't come up with an SUV. <laughs> and, and, and that's where we are. And the idea of a Sargasso Sea Commission, perhaps is the way we should have started, the defining ecosystems and having somebody who deals with all the resources. We could have a policy with tuna that contradicts a policy on sardines or anchovies in the same region. Right now, it could happen easily. So the ecosystem view was not initially part of the organization. We are trying to do patching up, and I will talk about some of that uh, tomorrow, but I think the idea of regional bodies with a complete ecosystem perspective to begin with is what is a change, and I think it's a valuable change.
we'll hear from Ann Powers from Pace Law School. Thank you very much to the organizers for, uh, for uh, uh, what is going to be, has been already, and I'm sure uh, will continue to be a wonderful uh, uh, event here. I, uh, our panel is uh, international governance, how we're dealing with international governance. And we've heard a little bit already from um, Jeff this, mor this afternoon about some of the overarching international covenants and international frameworks. Uh, David talked about the, um, basically about the uh, Law of the Sea Convention and then specifically about what's going on in the uh, Saragasso Sea. Um, I, I called this my presentation lessons from across the waters, but I, I really think it's more just thoughts uh, from across the waters. Uh, because I wanted to talk uh, at a lower level of governance, uh, f looking a little more at some of the lesser developed, uh, pr the problems of the lesser developed countries, especially the small island developing states, and uh, and with some look at some of the things that have happened, uh, particularly in the Pacific, uh, comment a little bit on uh, what might uh, be some developments there. Uh, and so we're, we're really looking at governance at, at all levels here. Uh, the, um, we're, and, and when I look around the audience, I see people who are also uh, very diverse and at all levels. We've got lawyers, we have scientists, we have people who are interested in specific regional areas or very specific scientific topics. Uh, and it's a little bit like the ocean that we're dealing with out there. It's very, very complicated. Uh, and I suppose we all have our, our sort of our own picture of what the ocean is like, what we think of when we think of the oceans. And uh, it is, uh, maybe they're parallel universes for, for many of us. But whatever we think of the, of, uh, the ocean issues, uh, or the, what our vision is of the ocean, there are terrific problems that we know about, and we've already talked about many, many of them. That's one of my favorites, um, the plastic ocean. So, so we're, we're, try, we're grappling with a, a complex system scientifically, and we lawyers have gone and complicated it up even more legally uh, because unfortunately many of the regimes that we've created, in fact probably most of them, don't bear a large relationship to the, the various areas that they're supposed to deal with. Uh, so, so complexity is, uh, is rife here. And all, often we, we focus on our own issues, our own geographic area, but we really should care, and I think hopefully most of us do, but people should care about what's going on in other areas um, because, of course, these, as I said, are extremely complicated and very much interconnected systems. The resources cross boundaries. They don't notice, the fish don't notice uh, when they cross from one jurisdictional issue to the to, uh, area to another. And of course, there's potential for both positive, but unfortunately also for very negative impacts from activities in one area uh, on another. Uh, not to n not to downplay either the possible potential for real conflict over uh, over some of these resources. Now, my um, colleague Nick Robinson and I have had the good fortune to work with uh, a number of uh, of some of the lesser developed countries and some, especially some of the small island developing states. Uh, especially in a, a program that we run for our students who intern at the United Nations. 
And these, the, the less, some of these lesser developed coastal countries and the SIDS are among the most threatened of the, um, of the countries by climate change and the changes that that's bringing, ab that's bringing about in the ecosystems. So the, uh, we know that we're going to have sea level rise, regardless of what a few naysayers uh, argue. And the small island states, of course, are some of the really most susceptible to, to what's going to, uh, to the eventual uh, sea level rise. And, and that's, that's terrifically serious for them because uh, the sea level rise is going to affect their tourism industries, their fishing industries. Uh, the land may be highly susceptible to degradation. And, and they're trapped because they don't necessarily have the resources to, to address these, uh, many of these issues. And many of these states also have extensive EEZs uh, they, that can be affected by, they can actually be potentially reduced in size by sea level rise and changing baselines, but they can also, those EEZs can be impacted, um, the resources within them. And that, uh, that's a uh, very serious detriment for these, for these areas because they, uh, they depend so much, as we know, on the oceans. And, and of course, some of these states have been, uh, in spite of their limited resources, very active in trying to protect their resources and to deal with the climate change issues. And I'm sure you've probably seen the pictures of the Maldives, the uh, cabinet, uh, uh, members in the Maldives who had their cabinet meeting underwater in, to, in order to demonstrate the fact that their, uh, that their island, uh, if sea level rise continued as predicted, might, uh, they might well have to have future cabinet meetings underwater. Um, and, and other states have, uh, have gone about protecting their resources by um, conservation efforts. Uh, the Seychelles, for instance, in the Indian Ocean have uh, protected a, a great part of its land and a substantial amount of its oceans as parks and preserves and uh, have implemented some pretty extensive conservation efforts. But nonetheless, um, and we see in, in the Pacific too, uh, that there have been a number of activities there, uh, countries that have, are affected by climate change but are still working to try and protect their resources. Uh, for instance, Tuvalu is a uh, is an, a small island. It's a very small island. It has a population of ten thousand, and um, it's one of the least developed countries. But it has an EEZ. It may have an EEZ of of um, a million square kilometers. And so here's a tiny country with a small population trying to protect the resources in, uh, in an area of this size. And of course, with a small population, like many of the other small island states uh, and lesser developed countries, uh, it, they're tremendously stressed in terms of human resources. Uh, when you stop and think of they're a country, they have to run their country and provide all of the staffing for its many functions, plus involve, be involved in foreign relations, and then sit in all these community or uh, committee meetings. Uh, so it's a, it's a very difficult challenge. The, um, they, they are, they do, do depend a great deal on, the, on their um, fishing for, for subsistence. And, and yet, uh, all, like many of the islands, they are having difficulty figuring out what kind of governance structure Will uh, will really work for their for their purposes, and um, it, the the whole um, question of our oceans and their complexity, I think, is reflected here. We can see. Uh, I like to use this slide with my students when I, I say, you "Look out! You think about the ocean. You see all the, the just the flat gray water out there." But it's just like the land, perhaps even more complicated than the land, with so many, so many types of uh, geographic features uh, and other types of features that we have to deal with. And, and yet, 
these small countries uh, are having a, a great deal of difficulty just figuring out what is the geography that they have to deal with, what is going on in their EEZ that they want to protect, and how do they go about protecting it. Now, uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention sets out certain kinds of, uh, of requirements or limitations. Uh, we know, we talk about today's oceans, our legal oceans, uh, the, um, and the one that we focus on a great deal is the exclusive economic zone, that area that goes out 200 miles basically from, from the, uh, a coastal, uh, coastal country's baseline. And you can see here the with the EEZs that are reflected, there's a tremendous amount of EEZ in uh, the Pacific and in other areas where there are small island states. So, so they're, they're, these resources then need to be protected, but uh, it's very difficult for, for these tiny countries with their very limited resources to do it. Uh, the major frameworks we mentioned uh, have been mentioned, we know, uh, the Law of the Sea Convention, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the, um, uh, some of the regional seas programs, and then of course national laws. Now in the Pacific, the, um, the Pacific Island, some of the Pacific Island countries have been uh, taking a little bit of a different approach to that that has been encouraged under some of the of these conventions, a little bit different approach than um, some of the developed countries. And uh, with the with the Pacific Island countries and territories of PICS, we know that this that fishing really fisheries really are a, an economic backbone. And the, they're a source of protein, a source of jobs, and they do produce um, a, a huge amount of uh, fisheries that are available for the local residents, but also for, uh, for the rest of us. Uh, there are organizations that work in the Pacific to help to, uh, to try and deal with these governance issues, uh, the Pacific Island Forum, and then more specifically in the environmental uh, area, especially the Secretariat, SPREP, IUCN's been very active there. So people are trying to, to assist the PICS. We, and the, there has been an effort on the part of these countries to try to uh, come up with a policy and implement the policies. Um, the re there's a regional oceans policy that sets forth both a vision of a healthy ocean that sustains livelihoods and aspiration and the aspirations of Pacific Island communities, and then the goal to ensure sustain the sustainable development use and, and the sustainable use of the oceans. So we're seeing in some ways the traditional conflict between setting a resource, uh, identifying and protecting a resource and, a question, and the more multiple use idea where we have to, um, where, we ha where we need to have the resource as a, uh, for instance, as a fishery. And, um, and, but maintaining a healthy ocean becomes something very, very important. The, um, they have, develop their own, uh, what we, they call uh, locally managed marine areas. So this is somewhat of a looser definition than, a, than we typically think of for a marine protected area. Uh, it's really designed as a multiple use area and, and, the, and it's based on local, local uses and local needs. Now, uh, there are some things to note and about uh, what's going on in some of these areas. First of all, many of the Pacific countries have a communal land tenure system, so it's different than in most of the developed countries. Um, very strong community ties often, and then a real devotion to the traditional knowledge, traditional cultures. So, it's not, we can't necessarily take 
the things that uh, we've seen with the, the, that we've learned perhaps from these area, uh, from this kind of local management. Um, and that's not to say that's working every place. There are uh, hundreds of locally managed areas now, and some of which may uh, may work better than others. Uh, so, so there's still a great deal that needs to be done there. But there are a few points that I think are worth noting. And first of all, is that collaboration and cooperation between the communities and the larger government entities is absolutely essential. And and, and we know that we don't. Uh, but this it reminds us that uh, we're not going to succeed unless we have that kind of co collaboration, cooperation. And it's called for by our, um, at, a, at a higher level by the, for instance, by UNCLOS. Um, comprehensive national legislation can help provide tools, but we really are also looking at a bottom-up approach. The more you can get a bottom-up approach to identifying the areas, identifying the uses, identifying the threats, and getting local buy-in, then of course, uh, the better off we're going to be. And again, this is not something that's rocket science or that's new to us. Uh, flexibility is crucial, and that's, with these programs, they're extremely flexible, perhaps sometimes to the detriment of the program. And then again, accountability and, uh, and enforcement's crucial. Uh, with many of the programs, uh, it is difficult to find out information, so you really very hard to judge whether there are success or not. So, things to think about, points to talk about, and uh, I'll be happy to take a couple, one, one or two questions, and then, uh, if, and and uh, we do have. There will be, I believe, uh, uh, quite a bit more to say about the Pacific Islands and about uh, issues there by people who are actually working full time in that area. And so uh, I'll certainly uh, be very, I defer to, to them on, uh, on uh, questions I can't answer. Yes. Okay. And I'm kindly, uh, one comment on uh, two of the things you said about the Pacific Islands. The first is that uh, you remarked that uh, export fisheries are the backbone of their economies, which they are. Uh, and secondly, that, that um, traditional customs were a very powerful source of, um, of governance within these locally managed marine areas. Uh, one of the dilemmas that's been found, uh, particularly in places like Fiji, is that the export fisheries are driven by forces different than the traditional governance. Uh, and, and particularly for, for a species like, uh, for fisheries like Beche de Mer, which, where the markets are in East Asia, um, you can have a very strong globalization pull that's actually undermining the, the, the ecosystems uh, and that f it slips through the net of, of the traditional governance. I think this, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not raising this as a criticism of anything you said. I think this is part of the dilemma that we have to work our way through. The uh, point is very well taken, yes, I think so. All right, thank you very much. They're retrieving it. And the last presentation for this panel is Nicholas Robinson from Pace University. Well, thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction earlier, and I too want to join in thanking, just so I don't leave anyone out, the Center for Ocean Solutions, the uh, Environmental and Natural Resources Law and Policy Program, the Environmental Law Journal, and the Journal of Science, uh, Law, Science, and Policy, uh, and uh, uh, Stephen Neal. Uh, this has been a marvelous conference, and I'll try to uh, pull together, not only turning on the lights to wake us all up, having had the slides, but pull together some of the disparate themes of the last three papers and comment a little further. Uh, we literally have an ocean of opportunities in front of us for improving international governance of the marine environment. Yes, hiss louder, I'm trying to get you motivated. Um, <laughs> Uh, the role of international governance uh, has been uh, very important. It's absolutely critical, but it's very slow. 
Uh, when Tommy Koh, uh, the professor of law, I, I should observe, from the National University of Singapore, an ambassador at large who chaired the Law of the Sea conventions at the very end of that process and also the Agenda 21 process, he, he made the point that UNCLOS is not a codification of the Law of the Sea alone. It certainly tried to codify, but it also was the progressive development of new international environmental law. And part 12 of the convention and all the articles that David Freestone put up there, including the critical uh, provision of all states having a duty to protect the marine environment, was new law. It was put in to the convention uh, following the 1972 Stockholm Conference and the sense that we had to do more. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which had been founded in 1948 to uh, build up a regime for the green environment of the planet, uh, with which I've been privileged to work for about 40 years, uh, IUCN uh, was instrumental in getting that Part 12 put into the convention through a lot of uh, lobbying efforts, education, and the usual agenda. Uh, IUCN went on to also develop other parts of this uh, set of uh, alphabet soup you saw, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species and the Convention on Biological Diversity. And the success of this effort was to create a framework for the management of uh, biological resources on the planet. And it was quite successful up to a point. And that point, uh, I think, is now at the uh, breaking point of the rubber band. We've stretched out what we can do with this system. We have to do more and do it perhaps differently. And there's a gap between what Jane Lubchenco spoke about in her absolutely marvelous uh, presentation this morning and our panel. Jane spoke mostly about national and regional initiatives, not about multinational initiatives. She only referred to one, the FAO, uh, which was an active uh, uh, part of the uh, US policy that she, she articulated. Not much about UNEP, I didn't even hear the word. Uh, not much about the UN uh, General Assembly and the annual debate of all the countries. I mean, the UN General Assembly is our equivalent of a, a place where ocean law gets debated every year and a very long resolution gets adopted. Um, not, virtually nothing about the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, which uh, I was privileged to play a small part in getting into uh, the world, because the US is not a party to it and not much about the con convention, the Bonn Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species, which was critical in several of the presentations, because again, we're not a party to it. Uh, and insofar as our State Department says the law of the sea is customary international law, they may include part 12, uh, they often say that, but then the actions have to follow the words and we don't do as much as we might as a nation. Now we are part of the South Pacific uh, Regional Environmental Program. And you saw the maps that we just had on, on SPREP. SPREP has been doing a marvelous job over the years, uh, 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 trying to build up a capacity and a confidence throughout the uh, Pacific region and the EZs of those, re of those regions. Uh, there's a Pacific Environmental Information Network, and Powers talked about the uh, uh, Pacific Islands Regional Ocean Policy. Uh, and SPREP is a very fine example of a way in which you can take all of the jurisdictions of these little uh, uh, small nations and begin to have build them into a coordinated system. SPREP gets some financial assistance from the Asian Development Bank, from the European Union, from a few others, from parts of the US government. But it's totally underfinanced to build a, a, a strong uh, a marine resources management system. Uh, and as uh, Kylie pointed out, uh, the customary law of, of the states, which worked fine until we had an international uh, exploitation of resources, has been overwhelmed. We don't recognize that customary law very much anyway in the UN system because it's not written down and we can only read in our uh, world. Uh, we can't listen. Uh, but SPREP gives us a model for how to begin to knit all of this together. Uh, another model is the Bonn Convention for Migratory Species. And just this February, the, uh, uh, the convention finalized an MOU, uh, one of the sub-agreements, uh, which you heard about in the earlier presentation, uh, on the sea cow and the seagrass conservation. 
Uh, and, and we could have a, a more proactive use of the bond convention. And we should be working with the states that are parties to the bond convention as uh, scientists, as lawyers, as environmentalists, people who work through a group like IUCN that doesn't have to have a, a national decision-making process, uh, because we can do a great deal if we proceed to work through that kind of a forum to help the bond convention become more effective. The bond convention, I mean, uh, we have the front row here. How many people in the front row? That's the Bond Convention Secretariat. I mean, we're not going to get very far if we don't lend a hand to the Bond Convention and other initiatives. And I think, uh, just to put the point not too bluntly, uh, we are in the Anthropocene now. It's not just that The Economist magazine made a nice front cover and said so. And I know you don't wake up every morning think about, thinking about the International Commission on St uh, Stratigraphy. Uh, you're probably biologists, not geologists. But basically, we are now in the middle of a determination that will be made in the next couple of years by this scientific commission that we have left the Holocene. I think the evidence is amply clear we've left the Holocene, but I'll defer to those more learned than I. Uh, we've melted or are melting the cryosphere, uh, the sea level rising. This is one of the measures when you can see the sedimentation and know how far the coast was or how uh, much the Earth's crust shows a different shape. This is one of the markers for leaving one geological period of time for another. We have encrusted the Earth's crust with a whole group of synthetic and organic chemicals that never existed before we humans fabricated them. So, and then we spread them around the world and discarded them as waste, and so they ended up in the crust of the Earth. And if you bore down uh, through that crust uh, 100,000 years from now or more, you'll always know when we didn't have those chemicals and when we made them. So that's another great marker. And then before the 1963 Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty, we did the same thing with radioactivity. So we know that we're in a different time period geologically, uh, and, of course, now we have the complications of ocean acidification and so on. Now, the good news is that having done that in the Anthropocene, we can do other things. Uh, Swami Nathan, who was the president of IUCN, one of the great scientists in India of uh, 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 agricultural uh, development in rice and so on, in his institute has now began in 1992. He saw this coming began to develop a hybrid rice uh, that will grow in coastal areas subject to saline inundation. They, it is a saline tolerant form of rice. He is looking to find a way to feed the people of Asia while their sea levels rise and intrude into the areas where they had been growing uh, their food. So we can use the Anthropocene uh, for good or, or we can uh, suffer uh, the consequences of bad. But we can't do it in the time frame that it has taken to build up international environmental law. International environmental law has taken us since, say, 1972, use the Stockholm Conference as a beginning point. That's pretty damn good from the point of view of international law. We've really built it fast. But we're degrading Earth systems faster, if I understand the scientific literature. So we've got to come up with a way to leverage more effective uh, uh, national and regional activity. And since we can't do that in Congress, it's ironic that we have a uh, globalization of the world and an isolationism uh, in our own Congress in the United States, we've got to do it through other, other vehicles. One of the vehicles which uh, Jane spoke about was our regional uh, fisheries systems and our states. Here in North America, we have states and provinces that don't have to go to Washington. They are sovereign in their own realms, and they can begin to build up cooperation and collaboration. Uh, and I think it's highly effective that we start to look at these uh, local and regional areas for uh, development of new capacity and new ways to implement things like Article 192 of the Law of the Sea Treaty that says we all have to do our part to protect the marine environment. Doing our part, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in a uh, World Conservation Congress in Jeju, Korea last uh, uh, September adopted a resolution on phytoplankton. I put on my tie for phytoplankton. You can't see it, but uh, it's, it's all there. Uh, phytoplankton uh, 
Nature in, in 2010 did a lovely world uh, review of phytoplankton and reported that in each of the 10 regions of the world they studied the marine environment, phytoplankton was in decline. Phytoplankton, of course, is absolutely essential for life on this planet. Uh, and we don't do anything to protect marine phytoplankton. Uh, we know it's under stress for lots of reasons. Uh, and there is no international movement to protect phytoplankton. IUCN uh, adopted a resolution requesting its director general and its World Commission on Environmental Law uh, uh, to uh, undertake studies of what should be done to build up the protection of phytoplankton, much as the case study that we've seen for the Sargasso Sea from David. And uh, we need now to work together on unprotected uh, resources like the phytoplankton if we want to maintain uh, our global biosphere. Uh, there was only the United Kingdom, I was very pleased to see, took up this resolution uh, with great gusto and helped to push it through. Uh, there was only one government that uh, decided to vote against it, and you know which one it was. Uh, the United States, for reasons I do not understand, decided they did not want to vote for this motion uh, and recorded themselves uh, officially as uh, against it. Um, I think it's on the theory they don't want more treaties, but I don't really fathom any other reason for it. Who's against phytoplankton? Um, <laughs> the, uh, what, what I think we see in the work that IUCN and the Law Commission will be doing in the next little while to shape a regime for phytoplankton and the beginning of a discussion of such a regime, much in the same way that David Freestone is, is, and his colleagues are shaping the regime for the Sargasso Sea, much as SPREP is trying to shape a regime for the uh, small Pacific Islands and their marine areas, or any of the other regional areas, is we have to knit together these disparate pieces of treaty law that don't fit well. Uh, at the Nagoya Conference of the Parties of the uh, CBD, uh, they adopted a, a really earth-shaking resolution that all this talk about synergies among the multilateral environmental agreements had to finally become operational. So they, they are now taking the CITES, taking the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, taking the, the various green conventions and putting them into a joint working group to align their budgets and programs and activities. This is a major accomplishment. Uh, and we need to encourage that kind of collaboration across these alphabet soup uh, uh, models that you've just seen uh, and create a new kind of law of the sea. Uh, when Hugo Grotius uh, wrote his great treatise on the law of the sea, he was trying to justify a certain right of access to the high seas on behalf of maritime nations, especially the smaller ones who didn't like the fact that the bigger ones might prevent it. Uh, and he basically created a model. Uh, one jurist, one uh, legal publicist, uh, uh, there was a, another fellow, uh, Selden in England, who was doing the same thing, but uh, Grotius got the uh, credit. Um, we are now at that same seminal moment. We in this room, we in this conference, uh, all of us who care about the biosphere, have got to create what lawyers in international law call a lex specialis a special kind of law for the marine environment. And that lex specialis for ocean law has got to come fast because in the Anthropocene, the changes are happening too fast. Uh, I tend to be an optimist uh, in my entire career. I, for those of you who are students, there was no course in environmental law when I was a student. Uh, one had to create it. And, and so if you can create a field of environmental law worldwide in one generation, in less than one generation, you can create a lex specialis for the law of the sea, and collectively we can emulate what Hugo Grotius did and come up with a, a better law for the marine environment. Its principles will be based on uh, cooperation, a duty of international law, on uh, something I like to uh, echo Edward O. Wilson as articulating biophilia. If you look back at his book on biophilia, why do we care about the Sargasso Sea? Uh, well, scientists might ob objectively care about it, but the rest of us care about it because it's a romantic, wonderful idea of, of life and nature beyond the realm of national jurisdiction. Uh, it's like Yosemite National Park. It's like any of the great uh, areas that we, we uh, 
have come to love. And so biophilia has prompted the human species in every country to create things like the UNESCO World Heritage Convention and to create parks and protected areas, whether on land or on sea. And third, I think the principle that will have to guide us in this lex specialis is resilience. Ecosystems have resilience, humans have resilience. It's time for us to recognize that resilience must be an operational provision. It will keep us, as an earlier speaker today said, uh, ready to bounce back when in the dark we stumble toward the cliff and decide we're gonna have to pull ourselves off the edge. Uh, I think we can do it. Uh, I'm, I'm rather optimistic and I was very happy when this conference was uh, called and convened because I think it's time for us all to begin to pull together and make this happen. Thank you very much indeed. In all of the talks, we saw a recurring theme that the ocean is both very big and very small, that the law is both very powerful and understaffed. Uh, the certain questions are very complex and yet also very simple. We sort of need more of everything. Uh, so what I guess I'd like to ask in, uh, in the spirit of Professor Robinson's closing remarks from his, uh, from his speeches, what do you as legal experts um, have to ask of the scientific community that's gathered in this room is a you know a particular request. What what will help you do your jobs better? There we go. So I'm not going to start, right? Uh, I mean, we've we've heard a lot about uh, starting with um, Dr. Lubchenco, the precautionary approach, right? I lo again, we we loved Alastair's definition of. Uh, not going out after dark if it's, you're close to a cliff. Uh, and precaution is a kind of a, it's really a creature of the, since 1992 really, it's a, it's a creature of our generation. It's being paid lip service to by a very large uh, number of organizations, including the International Maritime Organization, which passed a resolution in 94 or 95 about it. A lot of organizations in the fish stocks agreement from 95, but nobody does it or very few people. I just wrote a paper about, actually actually, this is, this is a wider interest, about the use of the precaution in fisheries uh, measures. And the European Union, it's actually a principle of European community law, the precautionary principle, and the European community don't do it. The, U, the State Department has fought tooth and nail against the use of the word precautionary principle in any international instrument since 92 preferring precautionary approach for reasons, again, which are, are far too esoteric for me. And yet they, you do actually do it in U US fisheries management. But at in the international level, it is very, very rare to see it. Now, one of the reasons for this is the, the, the issue of, remember, let's articulate what it is, that where there is an extra, a high level of risk, that we shouldn't delay taking measures in response to that risk because of the absence of scientific evidence. Uh, and it's very difficult to, I think, for, for scientists to kind of articulate um, risk in a way which is, uh, which kind of coincides with a precautionary principle. So if I can use the example of our project, one of the things that we, we're being asked by international organizations, the International Maritime Organization, ICAT, now for what exactly, what's the risk that you want us to protect you from? We have this lovely area, we, think, we agree that you've made a fantastic case for it to be protected. What from? Uh, isn't this intuitive? 
I mean, huge numbers of vessels plowing through these mats of, of seaweed, isn't this intuitive? No, you have to show what the risk is. And it's very difficult to get scientists to actually help us in that, in that venture, to actually articulate, I suppose by analogy, but also in a way which would sort of mirror the way that, uh, that Alistair described it as being, you know, the, a sort of, um, what, what's an unacceptable risk for, a, for the conservation of a marine ecosystem of this kind? So help us with this. Just uh, another point, perhaps, um, and I think Jane uh, Lubchenko is a good uh, uh, paragon of this. Uh, I think it's not enough uh, for those of us who work in law to remain ignorant. I think the scientific community has done a really a marvelous job uh, in the last 30, 40 years of educating the public, including the law, about uh, environmental science uh, and what we need to do to integrate uh, uh, that knowledge into our daily affairs, and it's had an impact. 147 constitutions out of the 196 members of the United Nations now have a right to the environment in them. Uh, that's all new and important. It means a great many countries, not ours, uh, are, in fact, are in fact doing something with their domestic law based on what the uh, scientific community has been uh, educating us about. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change will come out with its next assessment uh, report, and uh, we're going to have to really think deeply about these issues uh, uh, again. Uh, the fact that James Hansen was willing to speak out uh, against all the odds, and now you have a policy in NOAA that says you cannot prevent the scientists from talking to the media or anyone else when asked, is, is a great testimony to the responsibility of science to educate the rest of us about um, uh, what the scientific consensus or even th uh, theories uh, happen to be at any point in time. So I would, I would just encourage you to all become president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the way Jane was. Uh, get active and, and, and keep the rest of us honest. <laughs> Great. Uh, Kai Lee, uh, first to David's point, uh, Jane actually brought up something that's, that's uh, apposite to the point question you're raising this morning when she was talking about uh, how we, uh, there's a distinction between, uh, in, uh, between what's called a type one error in statistics and a type two error. Uh, and, and what you're talking about, the precautionary principle is really embodied in a way of <coughs> talking about a type two error, uh, which is you know, the, the danger of thinking nothing has happened when it has. Uh, and and uh, in fact, this is an area where I think science and policy and law uh, really c can collaborate more effectively. The trouble with articulating the precautionary pre principle uh, in concrete terms is uh, the, to articulate what the precaution, what you're trying to protect against, as you said. And that's partly a scientific question: uh, what are the risks that are out there? But it's also a question of weighing ri of weighing the risks socially, and that's where the policy questions, I think, come in: cost-benefit at, at 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 one level. Um, but there's now a, quite an elaborate structure that built up over the last generation uh, in risk analysis, uh, which is not very much in policy yet. And I think this, this is an, an interesting frontier to think about. Now, what I wanted to tax you with, it was actually the inverse of the question that David put to you. Um, because one thing I've learned this afternoon is that the words dynamic marine conservation do not fit very well when you're talking about I international institutions. Um, and I grew up, at, uh, when I was the age of the students uh, <coughs> in this room, um, I was, uh, uh, there was a great deal of idealism about the United Nations and about uh, mu multilateral arrangements, uh, a confidence that I think um, has eroded, I guess I would, I would look to the Convention on Biological Diversity as a sort of turning point, uh, something that, that uh, many of us had a lot of hopes for when it was adopted in 1992 and then to see how it, how it has fallen short uh, in the years since has, has really been a, a kind of bitter education. Uh, and you know, as, as Nicholas has said, the role of the United States has not been a constructive one in the, in the international order. Now, several of you mentioned the word Anthropocene. And what I think is characteristic about the Anthropocene with respect to dynamic marine conservation is the Anthropocene is a time when 
global action has become routine. Um, global effects caused by humans. Uh, and, that's, and these effects appear to be occurring very rapidly. Uh, the pace of change is extraordinarily rapid compared with almost everything, you know, this, compared with this cycle of the El Nino now. So, it's, um, so the question I put to you is what kind of institutional arrangements can, could even conceivably be devised to govern a system of the Anthropocene system, which is at once global in spatial scope and extraordinarily rapid and temporal uh, in, in its tempo. Uh, and I would, I would submit that the, we do have methods of dealing with phenomena of that scale. Uh, the financial world, for all of its instabilities and imperfections, they managed to clear their books um, <coughs> and, and to keep the books balanced. Uh, and, and I don't want to get into defending uh, capitalism, but capitalism works very damn well at that scale. And in fact, you, one might say that the, <coughs> the, the, the theory of change of the Anthropocene is capitalism. Um, and, but the question of what sort of institutional arrangements can work there, so it's, it's not that there are no uh, examples. What examples could the, can, can you imagine putting forward that don't have this, the clunkiness of um, <coughs> the, the international uh, multilateral system, which is in turn founded upon the universal consent and the Westphalian principles? Um, <coughs> you know, this, uh, <coughs> Jeff mentioned uh, you know, some 3.0, some sort of a, a web-based, uh, <coughs> internet-based way of, uh, of, uh, of conducting governance. I confess I don't know what, that, what, what something like that would look like uh, or could look like. And I, would, I wonder what those of you who have th who spent many, many years thinking about this had to say about how you govern in the Anthropocene. Happy to start on that one. Uh, thank you for the question. That's uh, indeed um, the central theme of my work for the next four years. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Uh, about the two types of error, and then I'll come into the Anthropocene. Um, yeah, there are these two types of error, the error of commission, the error of omission. And, um, and, and, and it's really been a dividing line between the conservation and sectoral communities. So if, if I do a predictive map of where all those fragile species are, let's say corals, um, the way most predictive habitat mapping works, and not all, but I won't get into the weeds here, the way most predictive habitat mapping works is that it makes very low type 1 errors but very high type 2, which means that a lot of that red zone on the map, on that heat map, actually if you went down there, there'd be no corals. But it could have been corals. There. Um, in those dark blue areas that shows no corals, there's no corals. So conservationists initially jump and say, oh well, this is precaution. Um, you know, there's more red on the map than necessary. But at least we know that if we protect the red areas, we're going to catch the corals. Maybe not in every place, we're going to catch the corals, right? And of course, the sectoral bodies on the other side, and this is what David's putting up with, is what are you talking about? How can you protect so much area when you can't prove to us that there's corals in every one of these places, to just corals in some of these places? And this is a real division. So when you talk about reducing uncertainty, do you want to reduce type 1 uncertainty or type 2 uncertainty? Um, it's a real question. But take it a little further. Now imagine that you're trying to meet the 10% target of the CBD. And so you say, well, we're only going to percent 10 per protect 10% of these red areas. Now, the chance that you've actually got coral has been greatly reduced. You could have, in fact, by some negotiations with the fishing authorities, um, chose places where they don't fish, and protected exactly zero corals, even though the model showed it was red, because we haven't got the research funding to go underwater and check every place on the planet. Um, so so the, the question of precaution in type 1 and type 2 error shouldn't just be to think and thought to one step, but rather two or three steps down the road. And you'll see that it's actually a concern to conservationists as well. Um, and, and I think that's an important thing. How to deal with the Anthropocene and nimble, nimble um, was, it was a uh, word that used to be used in governance a couple of years ago. How to be nimble. Um, honestly, I think that the best you can do is set up um, frameworks um, that allow for uh, transparency and accountability and decision making. And part of that is making the data available, which is what I was getting at with the space station pictures. Um, right now, VME data, uh, or VMS, um, um, yes, VMS, vessel monitoring system um, is 
the data are almost universally treated as proprietary data owned by fishermen. I sit on a, a respected scientific committee for a, a group in the Northeast Atlantic called ICES. Um, ICES committee, we are asked to provide scientific advice to the fishing bodies, and yet we have had the biggest trouble getting VMS uh, data. Um, and those data, when you get them, are in awful condition. There's a signal only once an hour or once every two hours. It's crap. In the, you know, it, it's like sort of telephone technology was in the 80s. It's the same time the VMS data was, you know, can you imagine using the same cell phone now? It's like, yeah, we got this great thing and it costs $5,000 and, and it only it's works like some of the time <laughs> and, and it, you know, weighs like a brick. Well, that's what, because it hasn't had an open market capitalist approach, because unlike the cell phones everywhere else in the world, they've been allowed to, in a competitive marketplace, develop, we have this technology that's frozen in time from the 80s that we're using to monitor vessel traffic, fishing. And it's secret. It's a big secret. Well, you can't be nimble, and you can't be responsive in the Anthropocene, and you cannot make decisions on the dime if you have these secret data collecting mechanisms using uh, technology from the 1980s. And that's why I'm saying if you, can't, if you can't get these bodies to adapt something better than just work around them, start taking pictures from outer space. Just one footnote, if I may, and uh, if I can steal from the uh, biography of Christina. She refers to The Rule of Law for Nature, a book forthcoming from the Cambridge University Press, in which several thoughts giving answers to your question are there. Uh, and I, I think we must go back to fundamental principles. I think we have to have a different set of principles to guide interstate relations. Uh, 1992, the UN uh, declaration uh, from uh, uh, Rio, uh, people haven't gone back and studied it, but it was incorporated into the domestic law of many states and they began to change their behavior. I think we need to come up with a new set of principles for the biosphere and our human interaction with it in the Anthropocene. And that book has a lot of ideas in it. We have a number of questions left and not that much time, so if we move through them uh, relatively snappily. Bon uh, My name is Jovita Deloach. I'm from the University of Paris, uh, Pantheon Sorbonne. Um, my question is mainly directed to Madame Powell, Powers. Um, uh, first, I wanted to just make a comment um, focused on the Anglo-American experience in the Pacific versus the Francophone experience. And if uh, you've had a, an opportunity to see how uh, the bottom, uh, top-down approach uh, used by the Francophone has affected their island communities and uh, whether you've had a chance to compare them. And then uh, finally, uh, my focus is, is how the marketplace um, uh, for fisheries has a big impact, not a big impact, but almost a determinant impact on what really happens in those EEZ zones. Um, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on that, thank you. All right, I, I haven't done, uh, looked at the issue, the first issue that you talked about, the comparison between the Francophone and the uh, Anglophone community. Um, on, the, uh, on the second issue, the impact of fisheries, it, it does, uh, it does seem that there are, um, can be some very pernicious effects from, uh, from the control of the EEZs. So I think, uh, as somebody else mentioned, um, just because a country uh, controls its EEZ doesn't necessarily mean it's going to control it wisely. And many of these smaller countries they don't. They don't really fish that far off of uh, off of their own coasts, and so what they may do, though, is issue licenses to other countries to fish in their EEZ, and so that uh, uh, and and they may not be well supervised. They may not be well monitored, and so that can cause uh, the negative effects rather than and then positive effects. And I'd be curious to hear from if you've had the experience in the area of other people uh, want to comment on that. Yeah. We'll, we'll hear, <laughs> no? Yeah, um, 
I guess I'm up. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Larry Crowder. I'm the Science Director for Center for Ocean Solutions. Um, and I wanna thank everyone in the room for coming. It's kind of frightening to be in the same room with economists and lawyers and oceanographers and <laughs> fisheries biologists and so on. It's unusual uh, for all of us, but I, I think that um, the, when I, when Meg and I began talking about this meeting, as a scientist, I was thinking we're very close to making the science case for dynamic ocean management, at least in particular areas where we have lots of data and things like that. And the question is, from the policy and legal framework, is there a way to move forward? And I frankly, this panel has discouraged me because it suggests the rate of movement is really slow compared to the rate of change in the system that you're trying to manage. And fundamentals of control theory suggest that the the management has to be as fast or faster than the dynamic of the system. Otherwise, you're driving the car uh, on an icy road with a three minute time delay in the steering wheel and the brake and you know, you're off the edge. So, so I think in terms of um, you know, Alistair's uh, comment about staying away from the edge, we're operating really close to the edge with a control system that is inadequate. And, and you know, that's a concern. So uh, Kai asked my question way better than I could have, thank you. But, but I, I, wanna, I wanna toss in another observation and that is a lot of people are now arguing from the perspective of control theory and autonomy for complex systems that maybe centralized top-down control isn't the best way to go. And that, that, that modular systems where the control is much closer to the dynamic uh, may be more effective. Um, and uh, and uh, one of the things that one can do thinking about dynamic ocean management or dynamic marine conservation is to not jump fully into the open sea where there are no rules, but to consider doing that work within the EEZs of nations where nations could decide of their own accord to go from static to dynamic marine protection. And I don't know that there's a constraint on doing that. So in the same way in the US that we're talking about marine spatial planning is stalled at the federal level, it's not stalled at the state level. And so I would like to hear your comments on the potential for um, attacking this problem as a distributed control problem rather than a centralized control problem. Well, I think you're 100% right, uh, as I said in my remarks. I think if we start working with the states in the United States and the provinces, I think if you work with the parties to the South Pacific Regional Environmental Program, you could basically quickly put in place a dynamic uh, marine system for SPREP, uh, but you'd have to engage with SPREP. And, you know, they have a secretariat of about 30 people. It's not very big. Uh, the current director, David Shepard, is the former head of the Marine Protected Area for the IUCN, World Commission on Marine, uh, Protected Areas. Uh, so you've got someone who's sympathetic and knowledgeable at the head of SPREP. It's a perfect moment to do that in the Pacific. Uh, uh, but you could do it everywhere else, too. I mean, we've seen it. I, I hail from, of course, the northeast of the U.S., and I think there's been a lot of that happening, in, not just in Cape Cod, but uh, or failing to happen in Long Island Sound and some other areas where we're engaged in it. And I think we have to work at that level where we can make things happen. When, oh, go ahead. All right, thanks. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, and Kai's question was fantastic as well. To work on the general principle, we don't answer a difficult question, right? That's a really difficult one. Um, Martin uh, Hall made the intervention about, remember, about the Sargasso Sea Commission as being maybe a model. I'm delighted that you think so, and I, I do think that we need to think of different ways to actually try and manage this, because the system is not only clunky, it doesn't work at all. Uh, and, you know, I, I think Christina is, is right in the sense that we need some sort of overarching framework to kind of pull these things together, but we still haven't really got to grips with getting the RFMOs to work, you know, in an effective way. It's the, the, the review of, of ICAT and its, and its uh, uh, management of bluefin tuna said it's popularly regarded as being a public disgrace. And you know, it's got better, but not much better. So we're, we're a long way from a, from, a, from a new system. So looking at new ways of doing things, I think, is a tremendous idea. But I, I think the point that was made a little earlier about uh, organizing um, uh, maybe a, around a systems, uh, around a particular geographical area, uh, mm -hmm. around, for instance, uh, Cape Cod. Uh, there's where we usually do see progress. So if you look at some of the major estuaries in the United States, we see some progress. Uh, it, 
perhaps at the, inter at the higher level, the international level, what we need is more goal setting than actual, uh, and a framework for communication. But it does seem that often uh, you're going to do a better job of managing a resource when you're at a, lo a, a local level, or at least a regional level. But the key again there is information People really do need to be able to get adequate information to know uh, what, uh, how to manage, and, and also participation by all the stakeholders. So you can't just have the fishermen and not the public. You can't just have the users of the resource and not others. Uh, so I think those are really, really key. We are slightly over time at this point, so really just one more very quick question. Hello, Marco. Good afternoon, Marco Olsen. I just wanted to hear your thoughts and trying to be consistent with the discipline I teach. I also very optimistic with international law. Even though it moves a little slow, we believe we can put up many wonderful systems. But once international system is in place, um, uh, not only uh, how to fund, uh, but how to implement, how to enforce. And the, the reason for asking of the 196 countries uh, in the United Nations, the great majority are countries from economies in, tra in transition or uh, poor countries. Uh, it's not a, s a simple matter of sending money or sending an equipment. And I illustrate my remark. Uh, having worked in Belize, I remember once uh, going to the university room and finding a gas chromatography uh, on the corner, and I asked, you know, why is this still in the box? And they said, well, we're waiting for the technician to set up this uh, Xerox machine. Uh, but how to build capacity, how to assist so that these wonderful uh, mechanisms will be put in place effectively? Thank you. I wish I had an answer. With the panel six tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I like I like to uh, make a request of this body. Um, here you have experts in many fields. It's uh, comprehensive. Um, would it be possible, say, in the future to have working groups? And here at Stanford, there is a, a design school that uses dynamic methods of group interaction. It's uh, worldwide and known in, in uh, its innovative work. So you have a lot of resources here. So uh, is there a possibility that you could have working groups? Because the fire is here. Just like working groups. Yeah, don't worry. Hi, Caldwell. So the Center for Ocean Solutions does work with the D School, and we have held workshops um, both internally and with external folks using the D School method. Um, that's a great suggestion on this particular topic. We also are convening a work working group on this topic, but using a case study from the. Gilnet fishery here in California. So you're right on target here, and um, thanks for your suggestion. I think we need to move to the next panel. Okay.